Welcome, welcome everyone to this segment of the Dave's Gone By radio program. My name is Rabbi Saul Solomon, the spiritual leader of Temple Sons of Bitches in Great Neck, New York. And I am very, very thrilled to be talking to a Tony winner, a two-time Emmy winner, a Peabody Award winner, and also someone who sounds like a really nice and talented guy with tons of stories and anecdotes about his life in the theater and in television. His name is Martin Charnin. You know, the sun may come out tomorrow, but he, he's here with us, coming out right now. So, Martin Charnin, shalom and welcome. Well, I, I've never had an introduction like that before. I'll tell you that. That's amazing. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Oh, it's a machaya to have you. back to you. So, th thank you. Th now, now, this is an exciting time for you because not only is Annie back on Broadway, but another show that you did on Broadway is being revived off-Broadway at the York Theatre Company. It was called Two by Two. It's about one of my favorite things, the Bible. Please tell us, how have you changed anything? Is it different from uh, when it was on Broadway? Or is it, uh, t tell what you know. Well, it's terribly different, but uh, I hope a lot better. Um, one of the... Uh dreams that I had as a kid growing up in, in Manhattan was uh, to write a musical with Richard Rodgers. Uh, and when I became a lyricist, this is uh, in, the, in the late 50s, early 60s, uh, I met Dick Rogers, and I guess I didn't really have the credential to be able to, to uh, ask him to collaborate with me. But ultimately, after working on several Broadway shows and getting some sort of a name for myself in television, uh, I came up with the idea of doing a musical based on the Clifford Odex play, The Flowering Peach, uh, which in point of fact was one of the first plays that I ever saw on Broadway when I was a kid. It was originally done as a straight play and starred that great Yiddish star, Menashe Skolnick, and I believe Skolnick made his debut on Broadway in that role, in the role of Noah. And I was attracted to the piece for a lot of reasons, but mainly because Noah, as created by Odette, was a really feisty, intractable, uh, screamingly funny, patriarch of a very dysfunctional family, uh, which reminded me in, I, I guess, many, many ways of my father. Uh -huh. And, uh, yeah, and, and, and part of that image of Scarlett's portrayal of Noah, which interestingly enough is very much on the page, it's not only something that Scarlett was able to create, but he was uh, really recreating what Odette said originally conceived, uh, and it was, I guess, 1969 when I went to Dick Rogers, and I, Oscar had died in 61 or 2. Oscar Hammerstein, by the way, yes. Yeah, Oscar Hammerstein had died, and Dick had had a series of collaborators. He'd written a show with himself called No Strings, and he'd written a show with Sheldon Harnick called uh, Rex. And he had done one with Stephen Sondheim called Do I Hear a Waltz? But they were all I went to, flops, unfortunately. They, they all well, did not they, do well. They were, they were respectable, respectable shows. Waltz ran, a, I think, longer than, than any of those that I've mentioned. Uh, but nevertheless, in, in my opinion, uh, it didn't matter about the length of time that any of the shows ran. What was important to me was the ability to collaborate with Rogers. Of course. And through his daughter, Mary, with whom I had written uh, the first musical I ever wrote in 1963, so six years later, uh, I went mm -hmm. brazenly, I suppose, to Dick and asked him whether or not he would uh, be willing to collaborate uh, on a musical. And he was delighted. Uh, he loved the idea. We went to Peter Stone, who was the wildly successful librettist. He had just won a Tony Award recently for uh, 1776, uh, which was a gigantic hit on Broadway. And the three of us embarked on a 
adapting the Odette's material and turning it into um, turning it into this musical. The other thing that was really attractive about it, it was sort of a precursor of, of where Broadway was going in terms of in terms of money and how expensive musicals were ultimately going to become. Uh, but this is only an eight character play with two sets, so it was a, a forerunner of the of the smaller type of musicals as opposed to the extravaganzas. And the extravaganzas, of course, ended up costing 12, 13, 14, 15 million bucks, and certainly cost that now. Uh, I know that our production of Annie that's on Broadway right now is somewhere around 12 million dollars. Get involved. Uh, and when I first did it, when I first directed directed Annie in 1977, uh, which is 30 years ago, it only cost 800 thousand bucks. So the the costs have <laughs> gone up considerably. But under any circumstances, I went to Dick and Peter, and, and we sat down and and had a grand time turning uh, the Odette's play into a musical. The problem that we confronted was who was going to play Noah uh, and who was going to be able to, I was fairly certain we would have no difficulty casting from the great talent pool in the country, uh, particularly in New York City, the, the, the other, other role, Shem, Ham, Japheth, and, and the wives, but uh, the role of Noah was a really complicated one. And he needed somebody who could sing and dance and carry on and really be extremely funny and extremely touching. You know, you should have gone with Menasha Skolnick again. Well, I should have. <laughs> I should have gone with. I should have gone with the guy who sold bagels at the at the, the, <laughs> the, the local bagel shop. The mistake was, was who was ultimately cast in the show, and while I do not want to disparage his memory, uh, he was the reason that the thing didn't work. He, uh, We're talking, by the way, about K. Danny Kaye. Danny Kaye. Originally. What? what uh, I mean, he, was, he was basically just a naughty boy, and it's pointless to, you know, speak ill with the dead, but... Oh, go ahead, uh, he's dead. didn't work. Well, no, no, seriously, because I've read the stories about this, and I've read that he was really, really a, a bested and a terrible person to work with on that show for, for yeah. various reasons. I mean, Zero Mostel was a naughty boy, too, but they were able to corral him on some yeah, level. But they, not only corral him, Zero had a great respect for material, whereas Danny believed um, that he was always bigger or better than the material that was provided uh, for him to, to, to perform. So from Danny's standpoint, it was, I, I remember one early review in Boston when we were out of town trying it that, that said that Danny is performing the show as though it was beneath him. And so therefore he went excessively out of his way to uh, ingratiate himself to the audience by going totally out of the play. And uh, that was one of his great problems. He felt that unless we were giving, he was giving the audience uh, 150% of that nonsense that he was able to do successfully on the screen, he wasn't giving them anything. So a lot of what we wrote uh, instantly became magnified, blown up, out of proportion, totally unfunny, maybe... Uh, something that you do in the movies works in the movies because you can if, if you don't like it a you can cut it and b you can shoot it again until you get it right uh here in the stage uh, on the stage you can't do that but under any circumstances that's the past and the past is gone and it won't come back fortunately and uh the other problem was of course the fact that Danny injured himself in the, in, in the piece and in 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 the injury the ticket sales just plummeted uh, we went from selling an inordinate sum of money, making an inordinate sum of money every week to practically nothing, um, and had to kind of hold, be, be held hostage by him by, by forcing him back into the play, which we did. Uh, and at the beginning, we thought, well, maybe the injury that he had to his broken ankle would make him behave, but Danny didn't know how to behave. 
So he did the first part of the show, uh, the first part of his return in a cast on his leg. But he was getting a lot of laughs off the cast, and so then he moved, when the cast was removed, he played it with crutches. And then finally, when the crutches were no longer necessary and the entire um, uh, ankle had healed, he made us build him a wheelchair so he could tool around on the stage in a, in a wheelchair, which he just thought was the most uh, incredibly funny thing that had happened. And he ultimately just simply destroyed the piece. I do know that Dick and Peter and I uh, never went back to see it after yeah. after Danny had, had uh, done what what he had done the third the third time, and it ran a year and a half based on the fact that people were not necessarily uh, knowledgeable or knew what was going on, but they wanted to go see Danny Kaye because he had a gigantic reputation in, in films. And ultimately, um, it made a profit, believe it or not. The show ran over a year, uh, and it was uh, the only one of the post-Hammerstein musicals that ever made a profit for Dick, aside from the, obviously the revivals. But under any circumstances, it ended, it closed, and because of the stigma, because of the reputation that it had, it had a terrible reputation back then, 40 years ago, uh, we ended up not being able to make anything happen. Peter and I, uh, Dick passed away in 78 or 9. Uh, I wrote another show with him, uh, which also worked, uh, which, was, which was a show called I Remember Mama, and of he course, went on, you, you he test. went on to do another a great many other musicals. I then did Annie and and several several other shows. But somewhere in the back of my mind was this in, incredibly uh, riveting desire to get two by two on again and do it again and do it properly. And it's now taken us to this this moment in time when I was able to find that Jason Alexander. Uh, from Seinfeld and many, many other shows, who is an old friend and a wonderfully talented, gifted actor, uh, was also fond of the piece, knew about it. Not a lot of people did know about it, but Jason knew about it. He did it in a, a workshop situation in California two years ago. I went to see it, and I thought he was wonderful, and I said, if I ever get an opportunity to do it in New York, would you even consider coming to do it? coming to do it for a limited period of time with the, the eye toward doing this production and then ultimately moving it on to, to, to do it as a revival on Broadway. And the moment occurred. Uh, the York Theater on, uh, in St. Peter's Church on 54th Street in Manhattan, Manhattan called, offered me the, uh, the slot that opened their series uh, this year and said that they will, they wanted to do it, and uh, indeed we are going to do it. I was also able to secure the services of an old friend and a wonderful actress named Tova Felcher. Oh, of course. Who is certainly well known to, to have many audiences, not only Jewish audiences, but audiences all over, the, all over the city and possibly even the world to play the role of his wife. So Tova and Jason are going to be doing it. It's only for five performances. Oh my um, God! Is, uh, did it sell out the first second that you you put the tickets out there? Well, the tickets went on sale about two weeks ago, and I think there are maybe fifteen, twenty seats left for each one of the perform. It's only five performances, as I said. Right. Uh, but there are a couple of there. There are some seats. Some seats left at uh, for the performances at the York. It's on the fifteenth, uh, sixteenth, and seventeenth of uh, the Friday night, the fifteenth. Saturday, two performances, a matinee and an evening performance, and Sunday, two performances, a matinee and an evening performance. But it is not a full-bodied production by any stretch of the imagination. It is basically an opportunity uh, to just reconnect to the material. Now, Peter Stone and I, about two years before Peter passed away, decided to go and re-attack um, two by two, which is what we did, and we were able to rewrite the book. Oh, so that's what I re asked. Uh, we reconceived it. So basically, it's a it's a it's a new production, a new revised production. It also includes uh, two brand new songs that have never been heard before. Uh, well, actually, they were heard. One was heard in Washington, 
in, in Boston, which is where we were out of town with the original production. It was a song for Ham. Um, oh, the guy ham. laughs and, and uh, Danny, Danny uh, holding us hostage, said that nobody sings funny songs in this <sighs> musical except me. So he forced us to cut it. So we had to cut that song. That never saw the light of day, but it's restored for this musical. And the new song was written for Tova because Tova had, didn't have enough material to do. The role of Esther, the wife, didn't have enough material to do. So she's gotten a new Rogers song, which I only completed about a week and a half ago. That's so amazing. And now I'm finished. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, well, hope uh, you're finished now. Then Now you'll see how it goes over those five performances. And then uh, you know, maybe you'll tinker a little bit more and then bring it uh, perhaps to back to Broadway. In the well, it, that's the goal. I mean, there really is a goal. We want to get as many interested backing backers and producers to come and, and see the project and to examine it uh, on, its, on its merits as a... Uh, from a text standpoint and from a score standpoint, the whole idea being that it didn't need, doesn't need um, any kind of gigantic uh, production values, even though it does indeed have animals and, and an arc and things like that. That's not what the play is about. The play is about his family and their relationship to God and, uh, and, and, and to each other and how... Um, uh, Noah disputes the fact that God has chosen him to be the savior that, that he ends up being by making him build the ark. But then it becomes a very, very simple plot about yeah. fathers and sons. And that's basically what father, sons, mothers, daughters, the interrelationships that, are, that exist as uh, frequently on, uh, you know, in Washington Heights and Rigo Park is, and, and in Chicago and in Denver and maybe in Denmark, uh, as, as they did on the Ark. Hi, this is Martin Charnin, the lyricist and director of 2x2, Two Two, which is going to be at the York Theater in February, and you're listening to Days Gone By on UNC Radio. Well, you mentioned earlier that uh, your father was something of that kind of personality, that character with your family. I mean, what was he like, and why was your family dysfunctional? My father, <laughs> my father was an opera singer. He was the Basso Profundo with the Metropolitan. Wow. And uh, I was, I was uh, a painter when I was growing up. I started, uh, I went to the high school of music and art in Cooper Union, but I ended up going into the into the theater and my father did not believe that the musical theater was anything like the high art that the opera was and he never really liked the musical theater so uh, a lot of, of, uh, of angst and service existed between between he and, and me and my and, and my mother who uh, thought it was you know kind of a terrific thing that I was indeed in the theater. Uh, my first performance, the first thing I, and only thing that I ever did was West Side Story, which is back in 1957. I was one of Jerome Robbins' original authentic juvenile delinquents. I was uh, a Wait, jet. You were a jet, and, I guess. Uh, yeah, I was a jet. And um, were, were you a jet all the way? No, just all kidding. the way from from. From day one, I was a jet. And do you have any memories of being directed and choreographed by Jerome Robbins? Well, I mean, Jerry was a taskmaster of the of the first order. I mean, he was extraordinarily talented and and dictatorial. Um, and while it was not easy to to love him in any way, shape, or form. It was very, very easy to be in total awe of, of his gifts and, and his theatrical acumen. Uh, he, was, he was just a genius. Uh, there, there are or have been very, very few people who have even approached his ability and his knowledge of the theater and how he could make things work and how he was able to connect to the material that he was doing. I mean, Fiddler is, is ah. 
extremely wonderful and, and beautiful as on many, many, many of the shows and uh, the, and, and the dances that, that Jerry did. Westside, in, in my opinion, being the prime example of Jerry at his absolute best, where the, the, the language of dance ends up being as articulate and, and specific as, uh, as, as, as the written word. And also, don't forget, I had... <laughs> I had Leonard Bernstein as the composer. Of I mean, he was the, 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 the genius who created that score, which still to this day, given, given even the shows that I've written that I'm relatively fond of, uh, just is the only, the only musical that, that, that ever moves me the way, uh, to the way any musical, any musical does. I mean, I still think it's just <clears throat> the, greatest musical that's ever been written and my instinct is that it will never be surpassed so there's something amazingly iconic about 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 west side and uh it was also an interesting circumstance with sondheim seeing sondheim and arthur lawrence and jerry and 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 lenny were together they never wrote another show together they never those four gigantic egos and talents were never in a room together uh, and doing anything else. So it was a very unique situation and certainly one that I was uh, very interested in learning about uh, how it all worked and paid strict attention to, to, to the, the way it was constructed, the way it was done, and how carefully every detail was, was, was uh, the attention that was paid to every detail from Jerry's standpoint, from Lenny's standpoint, from from Arthur's standpoint and from uh, Stevens. From, from Stevens' standpoint. And truth be told, I mean, even the, the, there's never even been a revival that has, that has approached what the original was. I mean, it is a, a, a landmark musical in the truest sense of the word. The way the original Oklahoma was a landmark musical, and all the revivals that try to improve it and make it better and make, you know, and, and adjust it, uh, they're, 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 um, break, they're, they're, they're fixing things that are broken. And basically that's, that's, that's kind of the exact opposite of what I'm doing with two by two. Because what I'm doing with two by two is fixing all the things that maybe were not broken when they were on the page, became broken when they went to the stage, and we went back to it. Uh, with a vengeance and try to correct as much as we can. The audience is going to give us a lot of answers in that five uh, performance uh, uh, situation. It's a very small theater. It, only, it seats less than 200, 200 people. Uh, and the tickets, have, which only recently have gone on sale, went through the roof. So as I said, there only may be, I don't know, 20 seats for each one of the performances left. But it's a, it's a wonderful opportunity, the more important thing being it an opportunity which you don't get to really have it in front of a thousand people. I mean, five performances times 200 people is a thousand people, so a thousand people are like uh, an exit poll at the ballot. <laughs> you get a sampling and you kind of know which way the wind is blowing. So we get a lot of answers in those five performances. Well, you have done quite a, a few musicals, on, and of them, only Annie, kind of, was, was the one that was this enormous monster success. Two by two, as you said, feels almost like a, a missed opportunity in its first go. Are there other musicals of yours, things like uh, maybe La Strada, or I Remember Mama, or The First, are others that you would go back to in the same way? Well, uh, I remember Mama is being done. It's performed all over the country. It has uh, it has a, a, a quiet little life. It's a small family musical. Uh, I wouldn't I wouldn't redo it. There's nothing to redo in it. It works as it works in, in the context of how it works. Uh, La Strada was a disaster. I was called in on the. Uh, they were out of town, and I was called in to to, to make adjustments to it. But La Strada wasn't. Uh, mainly because La Strada as a play, as source material, in my opinion, wasn't really very musical. So I didn't know where, where we were. We were floating around trying to make it work. It didn't, it didn't work, and it won't be revived, or it shouldn't be revived. Uh, as far as the first is concerned, um, I would go back. I would go back and try and, and re 
examine it. The first is a musical about the integration of baseball. It's a wonderful story of how J Branch Rickey went to Jackie Robinson and how Jackie Robinson had to suffer all of those amazing and awful indignities as he changed the sport. Uh, so in theory, if the moment presented itself, I would go back and do it. But the big problem, the biggest problem about the first is the size of the cast. It was done in 1981. And uh, at that time, you could hire as many people as we did indeed hire, and in order to make this musical work, you needed an entire African-American company along with a, a white company, because that's what the musical was about. So you couldn't do any doubling. And uh, part of the, 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 the horror of it is, is, is the relationship between the white players and fans and, and management and the black Ball players, so it's a very expensive musical to do. So if some, you know, generous, brazen uh, individual comes along and says, "Yes, I think it's important, and I think it's significant enough to be redone," uh, I would, in a heartbeat, go back and 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 try and, and put it up again to make to make it work. I wouldn't change it though. I mean, it's one of those interesting. Things. I'm not saying for a, for a second. That is perfect, but no stretch of the imagination is anything perfect. I don't know. Maybe the Sistine Chapel is perfect. I I really don't know. I've never really seen it. But my point is that that, that every the live theater in the live theater it changes. It changes actor to actor. It changes production to production. Uh, and and it, it it is alive. The theater is alive. And so the context in which you uh, see things from show to show to show to show changes, uh, unlike film, where once you shoot it, it's eternal. It's on celluloid, and you're not going to be able to change it. You can remake it, but you can't change what, what the original was. Now speaking... I wouldn't change it. I wouldn't, I would maybe look at some of the musical numbers and change some of the orchestrations. I certainly would change some of the staging, because I've grown a great deal as a director, and I've learned a great deal more. And there might be a possibility to make some improvements uh, from that standpoint, but I wouldn't change the text of, of the piece. Can I ask you, you, you also mentioned about movies and not being able to change them, and what, um, not that it's a, a bad movie, but it did not capture, I guess, the, the stage magic of Annie. And then even you have said that, that somehow that was also a missed opportunity. What happened? Why didn't the movie well, Annie... It wasn't, it wasn't you, you say... <laughs> It was a bad movie. It was okay. beyond a bad movie. First of all, mainly bad because I believe, uh, as many people do, that the wrong people were attached to it. People without the kind of uh, heart and soul that the piece needed. And Hollywood has a propensity, seemingly, to, to want to take Broadway shows and make them better. And invariably, they fail unless... Uh, unless the, the the original authors are are involved, and unfortunately, we sold the rights and gave up basically all creative control. Uh, something that I can never, I'll, I'll never never do it again if I'm ever, ever lucky enough to have that happen. But Annie is is, is <laughs> I you know I'm blessed. I have I have uh, created. Uh, I came up with an idea that became iconic. Uh, an iconic meaning, I mean, 35 years now that Annie has been running somewhere in the world, and there have been 28 languages, it's been done in 28 languages. Uh, they've made movies out of it, they've made television shows out of it, uh, but she still survives, and the songs have lived. Uh, the songs have, have become some of the most recorded songs in, in American musical theater history. Uh, tomorrow is up there and, you know, in the top ten uh, of, of most sung songs of all time. So it, it becomes one of those moments where uh, you get lucky very, really maybe once in your life, and that, in point of fact, is, is, is what Annie is. Uh, it's, uh, it, and it's lovely, you know, to have that happen, and my instinct is that that iconography will last. It will go down along with The Wizard of Oz and, and, and Peter Pan and, and The Sound of Music.
music is one of the, you know, one of the eternal family pieces of, of all time. We go to the theater now and we see, we see grandmothers who remember it from 30 years ago with their daughters and sons and whatnot who saw it 20 years ago and they're now bringing their 10 year olds to see it. Uh, for the very first time, so it's generational. It's like a relay race. The baton, the anti baton, is constantly being passed generation to generation to generation, as it is indeed with uh, with uh, other shows like Sound of Music and, and Peter Pan and um, um, Fiddler, for, for 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 that matter. Even even productions of Fiddler, you know, they last and they have endured. And my hope is that Annie will keep on. You know, hanging around and 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 last, and there will be a 50th anniversary production. I probably won't be around to see it, but if I am, I'm, I'm I'll get there with my walker, and I'll so give me a good seat in the front. <laughs> Now, the, the funny part about Annie, apparently, is when you were pitching it and trying to do it, a couple of Broadway musicals about cartoon characters and superheroes had flopped, so nobody wanted to touch it. Nobody was interested. And then you got Michael Price over at uh, Goodspeed. Somehow he was the one who, who made the leap for it. Is that what happened? Yeah, that's what happened. There had been cartoon musicals. Uh, Superman, Charlie Brown, uh, Little Abner. Uh, they, they, had, they had been on, on Broadway, off-Broadway. They sort of worked. Some of them failed. But the point was that... Uh, I had a different approach when I read the comic strip and decided to see if I could get the rights to it from the Chicago Tribune. My approach to it was not to turn it into a camp musical or a farce. Uh, it was to do it for real. And, and Harold Gray, who is the genius who created it and who drew it for all the years that it was in the Chicago Tribune, never bothered to explain in any of the strips that went back to 1925, how or why Annie and Warbucks ever got together. So there was an opportunity for us to take and make a uh, an original statement. We used characters, but we didn't use any stories. We didn't have a story, but we wanted to make it happen, our, our musical happen during the course of the Depression. Uh, we wrote it in the 70s. We were in a re relatively depressed state. Um, in 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 the country at that time, we were being Nixonized and Watergate and Vietnam and a recession and God only knows what else was going on. And Annie's about optimism and hope and spunk and and uh, love and uh, searching for something that you want and and ultimately facing all kinds of adversity and finding it and. That's something that has sort of been a common thread uh, from, you know, day one of history to now. Every now and again, you need to have someone come around, come around and tap you on the shoulder and say, well, it's going to get better. It's going to get better. If we didn't believe it was going to get better, I think we would all jump into the ocean <laughs> at this particular moment in time. That's, that's, that's... So any, any today feels like it was written for today. There's a, a, a line... Uh, or a political position uh, in that show that we didn't have in that show or have not had in, we didn't make no adjustments. That's the script that, that mm -hmm. 1971 and ultimately got on in 1977. Everybody believed that we were going to do a farce. You know, it was going to be Bert Warren and Nancy Walker making fun of those two cartoon characters. That was not what we wanted to do. I saw it as a much more Dickensian kind of piece, uh, talking about uh, ultimate truths in terms of human relationships, needs, wants, desires, and that was basically what uh, we ended up putting on the stage. Hi, this is Martin Charnin, and you're listening to Days Gone By on UNC Radio. I think it's great that you embrace 
your biggest hit? I mean, there are people who would say, uh, like a pop star who has, who is a one trick wonder, let's say, a one hit wonder, and they just they hate the song that made them millions of dollars and made them so famous, and they only wish, oh, I wish people would love my other songs that are even better and this and that. But you, you, you know, I love that you know that you wrote on some level an iconic masterpiece. You even told uh, theater critic Robert Feldberg that you wouldn't mind being known as Martin Annie Charnin because. You got lucky. You know, it was wonderful. Hmm? No, I wouldn't. I, I really wouldn't. I mean, it was always Bob. Thanks for the memory, Hope. Uh, he never he never shied away from the fame and and love that that was created by the fact that he introduced that song and used it as a theme song. I mean, why people use anything as a theme song speaks to why to some sense of pride that they must have in the fact that they that they've done uh, done something that the audience remembers. But then you go on and you learn other things about about their career and their life and their attitude. Uh, if I'm if I'm lucky uh, and 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 two by two two works, uh, it will it will ultimately I believe become could become could become uh, as as important as a musical. Nothing's going to become as important as Annie. I'm, I've, I'm, I had hoped over the course of the years that something might, but there's no way. Uh, and so I have put it away on a, on a shelf and said, folks, there's Annie, and then there's the rest of whatever musical stuff I do. Now, the, the... And Annie is Annie, and there's just no denying it. There are too many posters with too many companies and too many kids, you know, walking around right. singing that those songs and, and, and walking, you know, to, to come to Halloween parties in, in red dresses. We are talking with Martin Charnin. He is, of course, the, the guy who conceived and wrote the lyrics for Annie, as well as a bunch of other shows. But let us not forget that you are also a director. And one well, let us not forget that I directed 19 productions of it, including yeah. the, 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 the one that came to Broadway and started the whole thing running, rolling. I uh, did five national companies in in uh, in in the U.S. Uh, and then I did th three revivals, and I did three productions in England. Directed all of them. Directed directed it in Dutch in the Netherlands, in and went to Canada and Spain, and I mean, I've done it and seen it in, in many configurations. Can I ask then, in directing Annie over the years, were there things that you discovered like 5, 10, 15 years into the process of directing it somewhere else that you hadn't even thought about uh, when you first directed it on Broadway? Yeah, when I did it in Australia, for example, I did in, in 2000, we, we, um, I discovered that uh, I, I thought that Warbucks uh, had, uh, didn't have enough to sing. And uh, it turned out that the gentleman who played uh, Daddy Warbucks, Anthony Warlow, who was an enormous singing star in Australia, uh, also felt that way. And he said, could we write another song for him? And Charles Strauss and I sat down and we wrote another song for him, which we put into the show in Australia. And it worked wonderfully. He sang it brilliantly. And we recorded it there and everything. And then... I figured, okay, well, here, here now is an opportunity when I do any other productions in the States or anywhere else to incorporate that song. And it turns out that I tried it and in, in two productions here, and it didn't work at all. And the reason it didn't work was because we had written it specifically for War Warlow. So those kinds of discoveries you make, you make the discovery that something that ended up being correct someplace ends up being incorrect someplace else. And you have to just keep your eyes open and make sure, make sure that you don't impose uh, a, an idea that is organically someone else's or belongs to something else uh, on, on, on the production. You have to pay attention to what you're doing, and whatever it is you're doing is what you have to honor, and that's how you get it, get it done and, and, and make it work again. I want to thank so much 
Martin Charnin. I want to wish him a big mazel, not only on the Annie that's on Broadway, but of course the uh, two by two at the York Theater for five performances in the middle of February. Go see it if you can get those tickets that are remaining. And I just want to thank you so much for being so open and so true and so honest about your life in the theater. And thank you for, for being in the neighborhood with me. Well, it was it was a great pleasure, and I really appreciate it, and and I thank you. And the next time we talk, two by two will be on someplace, and maybe we can talk about that. Halavai, halavai. Thank you, Marjorie. Halavai. Thank you.